section here or that section there? Yeah. and director of this show, um, I'd like to welcome you on a wet, windy night in London. And I'd like to say hi to all our, um, we're live streaming the show to all over the world. So welcome to anybody watching on HowlRound, it's a TV channel through Boston. A um, couple of things, I'd like to thank our Kickstarter backers, many of whom are in here, Arts Council England, for funding the show, we really appreciate that. Uh, there's going to be a 15-minute inter uh, interval, and after the, um, after the show, there'll be a talk back with uh, Emma Norton from Liberty and uh, the playwright Helen Benedict, which we're, where they'll be discussing the difference between the UK and the US Army. Uh, please be, feel free to come and say hi. I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts. Fill the feedback form. Thank you very much. Enjoy the show. white like me. 
we were so alike, we were like sisters. And then, when I was 16, Grammy got cancer. And the day before my 17th birthday, she died. I mean, I knew that she was sick, but you just never really expect it, you know? My grandpa didn't really know what to do with me after that. He made me feel like he wasn't really my grandpa anymore. So I joined a graffiti crew, and I got kicked out of school, and then another. My boyfriend lived across the street from my school, so I would go to see him instead of going to class. I was smoking a lot of weed, really messing up. But in the end, I got sick and tired of myself, and that is when I started thinking about the army. There were recruiters in the hallways all the time at school, so I went to see one. If you sign up for the National Guard, you won't have to serve outside the country. National? Because that means in the country, right? You get 3,000 bucks just for enlisting. The Army will pay for college, train you in whatever job you want, and you get to travel. And all I had to do was sign up for six years. I wanted to do something I was proud of. I imagined telling my grandchildren about something I'd done to protect the country. It was the year after 9-11. I think a lot of people felt that way. So I went to the recruiter and said that I wanted to sign up. You're going to have to get your mom to sign that because you're only 17. I hadn't seen my mom in months. But I called her and I told her, if you want to join, forge my name, I don't care. So I forged your name? Right there, under the recruiter's nose. We do it all the time. Don't worry about it. Well, I got my $3,000. But it turns out it's spread out over four years. And they take the taxes out. The Army never paid for me to go to any college I wanted to go to. And it turns out you can't sign up for six years. It's got to be eight. So I'm in until I'm like 24. And I never got to travel anywhere. Well, apart from the war in Iraq. My whole time in Iraq is a complete daze. I worked nights, and we were shot at every night. Mortars were coming in, and mortars of death. You know, when they say that only men are allowed to serve on the front line, that's the biggest crock of shit. I was a tank gunner. When I say that I was a soldier, nobody believes me. Nobody listens. And do you know why? Because I'm female. Blessed are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. When I was a freshman in high school, I vowed I'd never be in the army. I wanted to go to college, you know? But my parents are real religious. Clara, you don't need to go to college. You can do God's work better in the army. It's strange, because she and my dad went to college, but they told me I didn't need to go. I was working as a cook in Bible camp in the summers, and I saw how I could make kids happy doing that. So I thought maybe Mama was right. Maybe serving food in the Army would give me a mission to spread the word of God. So she took me to the recruitment office. I was still 16 then. They gave me the test that shows what kind of jobs you can do in the military. My score suggested that I could be a nurse. I wasn't sure about that. All I'd ever wanted to be was a teacher. But then the recruiters started calling my house all the time. And one day, this recruiter came to my home. He was three years older than me, a model, picture guy, you know, blonde, blue-eyed, so handsome in his uniform. He told me I could be a chaplain's assistant. And that appealed to me because it was religious. And he was one of those perfect guys, you know? So I joined the reserves. Mama signed a waiver because I wasn't 17 yet. It was 2004 by then, but Mama and me weren't worried about the war. We knew you could die just as easily crossing the street. It's all in God's plan when you die, whether you go to war or not. Name is Terrace, Sergeant DeWalt Johnson to you. I'm 37 years old and the mother of four kids, two boys, two girls. My home is in Georgia now, but I grew up in DC. My life was pretty drastic. My stepfather was a drunk. 
beat up on my mom all the time. He beat up on me and my brothers and sisters too, but <laughs> he saved the worst of it for her. He hit her with a hammer, lacerated her legs, broke her skull. One time, he stabbed her 13 times with a long kitchen knife till it sank in so deep he couldn't pull the knife out again. She only survived because she was so fat. <laughs> By the time I was 13, though, I learned to fight him back. Laid him out flat with a baseball bat once. It was, I've got to kill this guy or he's gonna kill my mom. Soon as I could, I moved out and started living with my boyfriend. He's my husband now. A gentleman and a sweetheart. I've known him since I was nine. By the time I was 19, we had two kids and I was working two jobs, one at McDonald's and the other selling tour tickets at Union Station. One day this recruiter comes up. Have you ever thought about signing up? The Army will pay for college, train you in whatever job you want, and you get to travel. I got interested because I'd always wanted to travel. So I joined the Army Reserves, and that enabled us to get out of D.C. D.C. is such a poison place to me. All you've got there is a bunch of drugs and killing. Three of my brothers were shot to death there for no reason. My son was shot in the feet in a drive-by when he was just five years old, playing in the yard. It's because of the military that my four kids live like they do now. We have a nice house. They go to good schools. So I liked being in the Army. Then they sent me to Iraq. I grew up in a small rural town in Wisconsin. It's only about 2,000 people, so pretty much everybody knew everybody. <laughs> there were two types of people in my town, the people who left and the people who stayed. My way of getting out was to join the Army National Guard when I was 17. A lot of people from my high school were in the military, so it didn't seem like any big deal, but my parents weren't happy. I come from a very political household. My dad was an elected official and we're Democrats, so I had to really argue with them to get them to sign and let me join. Anna, we just want to make sure you know what you're getting into. But I was stubborn. I thought I wanted to give something back to society, do something for my country, but really, it was a rebellion. When I joined the military, I got an overwhelmingly good response from my community. If I went downtown or to the supermarket in my uniform, people were proud of me. It made me feel like I belonged. After all, it was pre-9-11. We all thought differently then. In August 2001, I shipped out to do my training at Fort Jackson, and zero day, the day you meet your drill instructor, turned out to be September 11. we just finished taking the oath when the sergeant said something about a plane hitting towers, but I couldn't really hear. People were running to the barracks, getting hysterical. The sergeant was saying, We're going to war! We're going to war! We're going to war! but I just thought it was part of the training. It took me a couple of hours to realize it was real. After that, there were rumors that training would speed up and we'd be sent over, but <coughs> it didn't happen. Training just went on as normal. We stuck bayonets into massive targets, sang songs about blood and killing, and didn't bat an eye, because we were already desensitized. What makes the green grass grow? somebody kills on the battlefield isn't because of our song. It isn't because we stuck a bayonet into a dummy on the assault force either. It's because our best friend's sitting next to us in the cab and we don't want him to die. My name is Miriam Ruffalo. I'm 27 and third generation Air Force. My grandfather and father were Air Force officers and all my life, I wanted to be just like them. I joined the Air Force Reserves after high school and put myself through school during my enlistment. I got married too and had a baby girl. My daughter was only two years old when I was deployed. That was March 2003, right as the U.S. was going into Iraq. I had to leave her with my husband. We're divorced now. It was so hard to leave my little girl. I kept worrying about would she be fed right, would she be able to sleep okay. Really hurt to hear a little voice on the phone. Well, I was on active duty for a little over eight years in the Air Force. I was a public affairs specialist. 
That means combat correspondent and a photographer. I loved my job. I am Santiago Flores, 46 years old and retired after 22 years in the Army. I was a drill sergeant who taught other people how to be drill sergeants. So I have a drill sergeant personality. I used to tell my soldiers, don't do that if you don't like me. I am not here to be your friend. You have an idea? You think it'll work? I'm open to that. But you don't mess with Sergeant Flores. Yes, Sergeant! Joining the military is not unusual for Native Americans. It's our way of holding on to the idea of being a warrior, of being a provider and a protector. It's something we find great honor and pride in. Because nowadays, it is hard to find things that bring honor to your family for Native. Till I was 10, we never lived in one place long enough for me to finish out of grade school. My dad kept moving to find one job or another, but also because he was trying to run away from his drinking. You know, drinking's a problem for Native people. Well, it was no different for my family. Finally, he bought a house and we stayed put. My dad's a supervisor in a bakery, and my mom's a bank teller. They raised me in a little town in southern Wisconsin. But I didn't have any direction after high school, so I joined the Army Military Police, became Specialist Sylvia Gonzalez. I did it for the money and the challenge and the discipline. My parents didn't have any opinion on me enlisting. If that's what I wanted to do, it was fine with them. So mom signed papers, because I was only 17. And then 9-11 happened, and I was mobilized to Iraq. 9-11 made a lot of people proud of being in military, including me. Oh, I wasn't scared. I was glad that I was in an organization that was going to do something about it. I never thought much about the war in Iraq at first. I figured it's not my place to get involved with something that I didn't know about. The thing that worried me was that I was going to be away from home for a whole year. They gave me notice three weeks before I had to leave. My family don't deal with things emotionally, so I uh, sorted out my stuff and I left. When I was 13, my dad brings home this white guy to work for Dixon Cars, George. This was 1973, and George was just back from Vietnam. He had one leg shorter than the other, and he spent a whole year in hospital with his wounds. And people said he'd raped girls in Vietnam. I didn't like him at all. But he started being nice to me, took me to a drive-in movie, gave me a joint to smoke and something to drink, and then he raped me. And I got pregnant from that rape. My dad was furious, but it was all my fault. He didn't care that I was only 13. So he makes me get in the car and we go looking for George. We find him pretty quick. Get in the fucking car, my dad said. He was six feet tall and people did what he said. So George gets in, dad drives us back to the house, sits us down at the kitchen table, pulls out a gun, sits on the table in front of us, and he tells George, you have five minutes and two choices, either marry my daughter or die. And all I could think was, if my dad shoots George, he's gonna go to prison. All of us are gonna be without a dad. My mom's gonna be without a husband. It'll all be my fault. So I told George, marry him. And he was my difference. My eldest son was the product of that rape. I love him, but he knows the story. He was pretty alienated from my family. And he hates having an Indian mom because he sees no honor in that. For the next few years, I'm living with George. He is beating the crap out of me, and I am turning to drink, just like the rest of my family. And when I'm 16, I get pregnant again. Birth control? <laughs> Nobody told me about that. And I had so much trauma in my life at that point. Who would have thought about that anyway? Finally, at one point, 
I decide I can't take it anymore, so I decide to kill George and dump him in Lake Tahoe. But he's such a big guy, I can't figure out how I'm gonna get his body there. I'm gonna have to put him on a boat alive and then kill him, and he's such a strong guy. So I think, okay, that's not gonna work. But by the time I'm 20, George has landed in jail again for attacking me, and I'm divorced at last. So there I am, living in a one-bedroom, cockroach-infested apartment with two kids, and I am on welfare. So I'm thinking, what am I going to do? That's when I decide to join the Army. told me that the only reason the military sent female soldiers is to provide eye candy for the guys, to keep them sane. In Vietnam, they had prostitutes, but they don't have those in Iraq, so they have women soldiers instead. It was July 2003 by the time I got to Iraq. We were in Fab Spiker, which used to be an Iraqi airbase, and there were huge pictures of Saddam Hussein everywhere. It was creepy. <laughs> Soldiers would pose next to them and take pictures like tourists. I was attached to an army engineering unit, and our job was to build bases and roads, and fix bridges. So we cleaned up the rubble and all kinds of disgusting stuff in the building so we could move in. Excrement, rags, bits of military equipment. We prepared the base, built runways, used scrap metal to make our own armor because we had no up armored vehicles. We built a basketball court for ourselves. Uh, we were doing nothing to help the Iraqi people. I was petroleum supply specialist. That means I pumped gas. My job was to drive around the base, refueling dump trucks, rollers, scrapers, wait for a couple hours, then do it again. When it was busy, it was really busy. And when it was slow, there was absolutely nothing to do. So I wrote a lot of letters, took pictures, threw rocks into a box. My unit was a real good old boys club, though, and I was one of only 19 women out of 141 people. The leadership didn't trust women to do a good job at anything. They were always hovering over you, waiting for you to screw up. Soon, you feel like you couldn't do anything right. And the guys had cases of porn, which they'd look at out in the open. They were always calling out things like, Hey, Peterford! I like your tits in that t-shirt. It happened so much, you got numb. Finally, after a couple of months, I started to go out on missions to rebuild schools. That was the best part of my time there. Then, I began to convoy to other bases. I was driving a 2300 gallon diesel truck, and because it was taking occasional gunfire, it could have burst into flames any moment. It was a bomb on wheels. The Iraqi people were pretty hostile to us by that time. When we went into a town, we were always looking at faces and hands trying to guess their mood. If they're staring at you, it's not in fear, but because they hate you, you know you're not wanted. We were told the kids could be dangerous too. They could be a decoy or be carrying a bomb. So if they run in front of the convoy, you're supposed to run them over. 
I'd been a daycare teacher before I got deployed, and one of the guys on my team who knew this about me said, Ed and I have been talking. If a kid came in front of the convoy, we don't know if you'd be able to run him over. I had to tell him, I don't know if I could either. Then, our first day out, a boy threw a rock at our vehicle. It made a crack like a bullet, and I knew then that if I had to hit a kid and kill him, I would. Not to save my life, but to save all the soldiers who might die. That was really hard to come to terms with. You feel so dirty. By the time I was deployed to Iraq in 2005, I was 35 years old and I'd been in the Army 14 years. So when I was on the plane to Kuwait and the young soldiers around me were making all kinds of dumbass jokes about going to Iraq, I gave them a piece of my mind. Hey, I don't know what this means to you, but to me, this isn't a game. I have four kids at home who will have no understanding if I'm killed. Back when I was training at Fort Bragg, I knew things were going to get bad when I saw how my command was acting. Instead of the leadership saying, we need to work together to bring these soldiers back safe and sound, too many people wanted to be chief and not enough wanted to do the work. And they were training us like we were going to fight in the jungle, not the desert. They made us practice lying in the grass and taking cover behind jungle plants. <laughs> there ain't no jungle in Iraq. Then I, I have this dream. I'm in a truck and it gets hit. The vehicle blows up. And all I see is a, a big ball of fire above me. My sight goes black for a minute and when it comes back, I'm descending from the clouds to my mom's house. My mom's there and she is going berserk because the news has gotten to her that I got killed. And that's what hurt me the most. The next morning, they ordered me to the firing range to practice shooting with live rounds, but I couldn't shake that dream. I get my weapon, and when I look up, the first sergeant and the commander are there, and I'm thinking, these morons are going to get me killed. And all of a sudden, this anger just comes over me, and I can see myself shooting both those morons dead. Sergeant, I can't go to the range today. Somebody needs to take this weapon off of me, please. No, sir. And I throw my weapon and my Kevlar on the ground, and I walk off. And then I call my uncle, who's a bishop, and I tell him about my dream. And he says it's a warning about my leaders being so weak. So I decide I've got to speak to them. So I go to the first sergeant. Sir, we've been here now for about four or five weeks, and for some reason the senior enlisted still have not gotten it together. Now, none of these soldiers are going to tell you this to your face, but I will. We don't believe that you are able to lead a horse to water. Well, he didn't like that. <laughs> he slapped me with an article uh, 15 that for attempting to destroy government property. That was with all my M16 and my helmet on the ground. And then, he tried to send me for a mental eval. Sir, I have been in the Army 14 years, sir, and I have never been sent for a mental eval. Just talk to me, sir, when there's a problem. I, I know when I get tense, my brows kind of frown up, but it really doesn't mean anything. I'm not as fierce as I look. So, I thought that was the end of that. Two weeks later, we were deployed. When we flew into Kuwait, there was nothing to do for six weeks. I had my 20th birthday there, but otherwise I just sat around and played cards. And then finally, in June 03, we convoyed to Baghdad's Cat Mustang in the Green Zone. Our mission was to reinstall the police force, guard it from the looters, fix it up, weed out the good police from the bad, and we took them right. allowed him to do that anymore. Some were part of the insurgency. 
Later, we moved to this different base where we were sleeping in tents with sandbags around them. <laughs> we didn't have any protection from water there. This tent just down the road from us got hit, shredded. My friend Sandra had just left a latrine when it got mortared. She turned around. It was gone. My first five months, the routine was the same every day. You get up, you load the trucks with equipment, go through inspections, meet with the squad about where we're gonna go, then I'd have breakfast, and then I'd climb into a Humvee with the two guys that made up my team and convoy to a camp in, to a station in Baghdad. And 12 hours later, the next squad comes, relieves you, you load up, go home, put everything away, go to sleep, and do it all over again the next day. Being the lowest ranking soldier in my team, I was the gunner. That meant that when we were driving, I was sticking out of the rooftop of the Humvee with my 50 cal machine gun in this little gun turret. Now in the turret, you're exposed from name tag up. We didn't have any shields. Luckily, in the beginning, we mostly got waves and good feedback. We had like 20 kids running after us, <laughs> dancing for us. But some of the women did run away. But later, people got hostile. People stare at you. Dirty looks, you the finger. People tell you to go home, throw a rock at you. And guys expose themselves because they see nothing. As a soldier, the hostility doesn't bother me. But as a woman, it bothers me a lot. I hate it when guys do that. Iraqi or not, I think it's sick and disgusting. And some of our own soldiers were a problem too. You may flirty or sexual comments, they stare at you. That was the thing that I couldn't stand, man. You walk into the chow hall, there's a bunch of guys who just stop eating and stare at you. <laughs> Every time you bend over, somebody's gonna say something. It got to the point with me where I, I was afraid of walking past certain people because I didn't want to hear their comments. It just really wears you down. I loved my job, and I did. But right from that time at boot camp up until I got out, I was harassed all the time. People used to call me Air Force Barbie. I couldn't go anywhere without being watched by a million eyes. I had a senior, non-commissioned officer, constantly quiz me about my sex life, show up at my barracks at odd hours of the night, and ask me personal questions that no supervisor should ever have the right to ask. I had a colonel she had sexually harass me in ways I'm too embarrassed to explain. These are the people who had complete control over my life. When I worked, when I ate, when I slept, when I could talk or not talk, rest or not rest. These are the people who I was supposed to obey no matter what. One time my sergeant came sit with me in the chow hall and he said, I feel like I'm a fishbowl the way all these men's eyes are boring into your back what my life was like, I said. Finally, I went to my leadership and explained the situation. I was told to write an MFR, a memo for record, every time that officer said or did anything that made me feel uncomfortable. Well, I did that for months, till I had a binder just full of those memos. I took it straight to senior leadership. Did that officer get punished? No. He went on to make E9 which is the highest enlisted rank in the armed forces. Why am I complaining? It was only words and gestures, right? But it should never have happened. I was a hard worker who loved her service and country. This is not what I deserved. But like so many other females in the military, I put up with it for the good of my family, my beliefs, and my country. Well, after my first deployment, I decided the constant harassment was all just a part of being a female in the military. And I made the decision not to tell anyone any more about my problems. Excuse my language, but I decided to be a bitch. Bitch! When I got to Iraq in November 2005, I was still hoping to do God's work among my fellow soldiers. I was there for a year, and in the beginning I was attached to a company out of Alaska. My platoon had 60 men and one lone female, me. I was also the youngest, still 17. Because I was the only female there, men would forget in front of me all the time and say these terrible derogatory things about women. 
I had to hear these things every day. I'd have to say, hey! And then they'd look at me all surprised and say, oh, we don't mean you. One of the guys I thought was my friend tried to rape me. Two of my sergeants wouldn't stop making passes at me. Everybody in the army is supposed to have a battle buddy. Females are supposed to have one that goes on the trains with or the showers. That's so they don't get raped by the men on their own side. But because I was the only female, I didn't have a battle buddy. My battle buddy was my gun and my knife. When we drove up into Iraq on a convoy in April, we saw how the people were living. It was so sad. We saw kids on the sides of roads using hand signals to beg for food and water. Kids barefoot and dirty. I saw how they live in makeshift mud houses held together with pieces of clothing or plastic. It makes us realize how blessed we are. Seeing those kids, though, made me miss my own <clears throat> real bad. And my youngest, he don't beat around the bush. On Mother's Day, he sent me an email that said, Mommy, love you. Happy Mother's Day. Wish you were here. Hope you don't get killed in Iraq. Okay, bye. We were based at Camp Adder in the south, but it wasn't long before they sent me on a convoy up to Camp Anaconda, which is 50 miles north of Baghdad. <laughs> Anaconda got mortared so much, the soldiers called it Mortarita Bill. But our trucks had no armor, nothing. And we weren't even authorized to be out on that road, but they sent us on out anyway. And at night, too. It was a suicide mission. I'm driving the middle gun truck when an IED goes off right under the truck in front of me. It was so loud, it scared the living shit out of me. My heart was pumping so fast, it felt like it was gonna jump right out of my chest. But I showed none of what I was feeling to my soldiers. Two days later, the commanders ordered us out into formation. I expected some kind of apology, but they were blabbering on about nothing, setting up the internet, how we're violating dress codes by wearing the wrong t-shirts for PT. Dude, I've been fired at. I don't want to hear about no goddamn t-shirts. Then they asked, anybody got anything to say? Nobody said anything. These soldiers were young and trained not to question their seniors. So I raised my hand. First Sergeant, did you all forget about the incident two days ago? Do you realize that none of your soldiers have any confidence in the leadership now? Don't you give a damn about us? The First Sergeant gives me this look like he wants to kill me, but he don't say nothing. See. When you have a female with that type of attitude in the military, it does not go over well with a lot of men. I was deployed to Iraq in 2004 when I was 42 years old and a staff sergeant with 19 years of service under my belt. I was so proud of what I'd done in the military that when my two sons grew up, I encouraged them to join too. One's in the Army, the other's a Marine. And by the time I got sent to Iraq, they gave me seven grandchildren. I was based at Camp Cedar II, a convoy pit stop about 185 miles southeast of Baghdad. I was put to work with a lieutenant in charge of organizing the movement and repairs of all the vehicles. But they were so messed up, they didn't know how many soldiers they had. You could be missing for a week, and nobody would know. So I thought, OK. They don't know what they're doing any better than I do. And I started organizing the whole thing myself. But we were under command of this female major, a white woman who hated anyone who wasn't white and male. She would place every soldier of color with a white soldier, and she made the soldiers of color train the white people who would take over their jobs. She destroyed the careers of many soldiers of color doing that. But if you said anything, you'd be punished. 
one of the first things she did when we got to Iraq was she made me and the other female non-commissioned officers move into the same tent as the privates. We literally had that much space between our bunks. Now, you do not move a higher ranking soldier in with a lower ranking. It makes you lose your power base because it's their territory. The major knew this. That's why she did it. Soon, the privates are refusing to obey our orders. This one girl, Benson, she had a canopy over her bed with pink blankets, and I thought, what the fuck? But when I tell her to move her bed over a foot to make room for me, she goes into this itty bitty little voice like a baby. I don't care what you say, I'm not moving, Sergeant Flores. But I got worried about what my young soldiers were going through out there on the roads in Iraq. One was this young female sergeant who trained as a driver, but they made her into a gunner because there was a shortage of military police to do the job. That's how a lot of women end up at combat in this war. So she and her team were out on the road one day, and they were attacked with mortars and grenades. So the sergeant fires back with her machine gun. And she kills a bunch of civilians. she gets back, she's all excited and shouting about what had happened. Calm down! Right now, right now your adrenaline's up. Tomorrow's gonna be a different story. And then I realized the combat stress fiend hasn't shown up. Now they're supposed to come help soldiers who've been in battle like this. But nobody bothered to come. Go to bed, it'll be fine. But I'm not bothered. Sure enough, the next morning, this sergeant and her team are a mess. One's lying in her bunk in a fetal position and the others are sobbing because, well, they've killed all these innocent people. And Benson, the girl with the pink blankets, well, she was driving a large truck in a convoy. Now, over there you drive on the opposite side of the road a lot to avoid IEDs and you drive fast. So one day this car was coming towards them, but nobody had time to get out of the way. So the car ends up driving right underneath the truck. Killed four children, both the parents. There was blood and body parts all over the place. So when she gets back to camp, she's in shock. I guess she thought I was still mad at her because she just stood there and didn't say anything. So I hugged her. She started crying. She was only 20 years old. We should have debriefed these girls. They should have had a combat stress person there, but they didn't. Nobody was taking care of these kids. So you can imagine the condition they were in when they got back home. And I know it's not getting any better. In October 03, I was sent up to Baktaba, just northeast of Baghdad. We stayed in Camp War Horse. One night, we were in the wreck building. I was doing my email when the whole building shook. There was this high-pitched squealing sound and a flash, and it went black. Everybody stared at each other a second, then dropped to the ground. 20 seconds later, another bomb came in. I grabbed somebody's shirt. Take me to the bunker. We got outside. There was no bunker. Another mortar dropped 50 meters away. Shrapnel was flying over our heads. This girl was lying on the ground screaming. My phone's coming out of my arm. My phone's coming out of my arm. Someone inside the building was calling. Medic! Medic! I ran back inside. I saw four bodies on the ground. Two Iraqi workers and two American soldiers. I started working on them. It was black in there, and all I had was this tiny blue flashlight to see. Blood was all over the place. This female was lying on the ground, covered in it, and this guy called Sergeant Hill was helping her. I said, is this blood all hers? Is an artery hit? He said, no, I think some of it's mine. I got hit too, but she's worse. I found someone else to help her, and then I lifted his arm, and there was all this blood. He was much worse than her, but he didn't realize because he was in shock. 
We packed all the wounded into the Humvee. I was holding back this guy's blood with my hand. I didn't have anything else. Another mortar dropped. We had no flat jackets, no Kevlars, nothing. So we threw our bodies on top of the patients. The mortar stopped long enough for us to drive the wounded to the hospital. As soon as we got there, I saw a nurse and yelled, this is Sergeant Hill. He's 32. He's O positive. He needs blood now. How do you know? Because I'm covered in blood and none of it's mine. The only thing that helped me survive my time in Iraq was my boyfriend, Stephen. I couldn't have got through it without him. We met the night I arrived at Fort Dix, New Jersey for my AIT. We started talking immediately. He said, give me your number. And then later he texted me saying, what's good? We started going out right away. Stephen's black, but he looks kind of Dominican. Real cute, six foot, big muscular guy from New York. Now, you're not allowed to fraternize in the army, which means have a relationship, but everybody does. And because he was a sergeant and I was a specialist, nobody could know about us. Everybody knew. And then I got pregnant by him. So I couldn't deploy when he did and the rest of my team did. I had to stay behind at Fort Dix with strangers. And then, after three months, I had a miscarriage. made me feel really empty and sad. I really loved Stephen, and I really wanted to have his baby. They gave me one month to recover, and then they said, you're going to Iraq, which made me really mad. One month is not enough time to get over losing a baby. But in February 05, I was sent to Fog Spiker. They put you in this tiny chew, which is uh, like this little trailer that sleeps two people, but you gotta share it with three. Night I arrived, it was so tight in there, I had to squeeze my way into it. I had to get along with the girl on my right. But the girl on my left was a friend from before. She didn't know I was coming. She was so excited to see me, because last she'd heard, I was pregnant. First thing I did was I put on my favorite perfume, and I went to look for Stephen. We haven't seen each other for four months, and he knows I'm coming, but he doesn't know when. Okay, so I knock on his door. And his roommate said that he didn't know where he was. And then I remembered the time difference, that when it was midnight for him, it was 3 o'clock for me, and that's when we would talk online. So I thought, I know where he is. So I ran over to the recreational building. And sure enough, there he was, sitting at a corner computer with his back to me. Now, I didn't go up to him right away. Instead. I sat down at a computer and I logged online. Sure enough, there he was. So I wrote, I'm in Kuwait, it's really cool that I'm on your time zone. And then he wrote, it's weird, I can smell you. I must really miss you because I can smell your perfume. So then I wrote, turn around. And he turned around and he just started laughing. In each police station that we fixed up in Baghdad, we'd uh, go through the day searching people coming into the station and switching guard positions. He'd be there 12 hours every day, standing or sitting. It is hot. You can't move. You have to watch everybody all the time. You get used to that. The thing that I couldn't stand was the people that I was working with. My squad leader was a pervert. He was old, like 35 or 40. <laughs> he used to point out these little Iraqi girls and say these disgusting sexual stuff about them all the time. These girls are like 12 or 13 years old. But the worst was my team leader. He made passes at me at first, stopped. But then he tried to have revenge by controlling everything I did. So I had to eat with him because he wouldn't let me eat with my friends. I had to clean my weapon with him. He wouldn't let me speak to anybody. So I'd 
sit up in my Humvee turret all day long just to get away from him alone every day. And people knew it. They'd come up to me and say, Man, your life sucks. When I tried to get switched, they wouldn't do it. And that just really made me hate my time there. I got the way I didn't trust anybody that was in my company after a few months. I didn't trust anybody at all. I still don't. During my first few months in Iraq, my sergeant assaulted and harassed me so often that I couldn't take it anymore. So I decided to report him. But when I turned him in... The one common factor in all these problems is you. Don't see this as a punishment, but we're going to have you transferred. Then that same sergeant got promoted right away. I didn't get my promotion for six months. They transferred me from Mosul to Rawa. Rawa was nothing but a tent camp on the Syrian border covered in sand. The camp had Marines, Navy, Air Force, and Army. There were over 1,500 men in the camp, and less than 18 women. So it wasn't any better than the first platoon I was in. I was fresh meat to the hungry men there. I was less scared of the mortar rounds that came in every day than I was of the men who shared my food. I would never drink late in the day, even though it was so hot, because the Porter Johns was so far away, it was dangerous, so I'd go for 16 hours in 140 degree heat and not drink. I just ate Skittles to keep my mouth from being too dry. I collapsed from dehydration so often I have IV trap lines from all the times they had to rehydrate me. They made me cook because I was female, so I wanted to do other jobs too. So I was cooking 1,500 meals three times a day. I worked from four in the morning till nine at night the next day. I was exhausted all the time. One day, somebody wrote my name on a porta john saying I'd had sex with a lot of people. Only they put it in much worse words than that. But when I wasn't working, I went to chapel and then I went to bed and that was all I did. Work, chapel, bed. Work, chapel, bed. It was so untrue, but I couldn't prove it. I couldn't defend myself. Nobody there wanted to believe me. Nobody was on my side. I always tried to stay cheerful and be nice to everybody. Back in boot camp, I was known as Sunshine. But within a few months, I went from cheerful and smiling to bursting into tears all the time. I couldn't even smile anymore. I called Mama crying, and told her what they were doing to me. If you were treading the path of righteousness, none of this would be happening. When I was working at the entrance of Spiker, I saw convoys being hit all the time. Highway 1 ran right past our base. We used to call it the Highway of Death because so many people got killed there by IEDs and mortars. Once this convoy got hit, it it was this huge flash in the night, and then they drove to us with their wounded. This civilian got out of his car and started throwing up because his brother, who was sat next to him, had been shot in the throat. I was on a tank out in the road, just, just looking at him. We radioed for an ambulance, but they have to go through all this clearance and shit, so by the time it arrived, it was too late. The guy was already dead. I never really thought about death that much when I was in Iraq. I figure everything happens for a reason and I'm gonna die anyway, so I was never really afraid of dying. What I was afraid of, though, was losing a limb or, or scarring my face or tripping. Because walking is really hard, you know, it's hot and you got all this heavy equipment which weighs nearly half your weight if you're small like me. And I was worried about our equipment, too. We had these um, flak jackets from Vietnam that everybody said were no good against AK-47s. Which is what the Iraqis are shooting. Our radios were old and broken. Our ambulances rattled and shook. I cannot imagine having to travel in one of those wounded. But I didn't mind working at the checkpoint. I got to work with Steven that way because he was the team leader. And the sunrises and the sunsets were beautiful. 
And I got along with the guys on my team most of the time. A couple of things that they did bothered me. Stephen went home for two weeks on R&R. &R, and when he was gone, they hit on me all the time. And then when he came back, they made up all these stories about me, hoping that we would break up and then they would get a chance with me. Oh, and if we were attacked, they'd make me stay right at the back of the tank. And they'd be like, no, because you're like a little sister. We don't want anything to happen to you. And I'd be like, no. Don't look at me like I'm your little sister. I am a soldier, not a gender. I'm a soldier just like you. Well, then they took it to the next level. We had to guard out in the road. Nobody wants to guard out in the road. The soldier that's out in the road is known as the sacrifice soldier. Because you're the first to be hit if anything happens. For a while, they put me out there every night. They didn't want to hear me say, I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier, just like you, and you, and you. My second deployment was to Afghanistan with the Army 10th Mountain Division. Now, by this time, I'm a sergeant with years of sexual harassment under my belt. So I decided this time it was going to be different. This time, I decided to put up a wall. Now, my wall became thicker and thicker. You know, normally I'm a very bubbly person, but all that disappeared behind the wall. And to this day, I don't know if I've ever regained that part of myself. But you have to put up a wall and act like one of the boys, even if it means losing who you are. You become very cold, and you don't show your emotions. And you don't let anyone in, because if you do, they will walk all over you. A couple of months into my deployment, I was directed to pull night guard duty. Now, I smoked like a chimney when I was in Afghanistan, and this night was no exception. So after a few hours, I put my weapon on my radio in the guard shack and walked 20 feet to the closest smoke break. You don't ever leave your weapon unattended in a combat zone. I had a momentary lapse. Thought I would be okay 20 feet from my weapon. <coughs> I was wrong. just taken a few drags in my cigarette when somebody grabbed me in a chokehold and dragged me behind some power generators. All I could see was a man much larger than me in the U.S. Armed Forces uniform. I struggled with all my strength to get free while he dragged me to his spot. I tried my hardest to fight him off and I got him in a few kicks, but it wasn't enough. Well, I waited until my shift was over and then did what every law and order show says to. Don't take a shower, go straight to the authorities. I thought they would listen to me. I was wrong. They told me if I filed a claim that I'd been raped, I'd also be charged with dereliction of duty for leaving my weapon unattended in a combat zone. That could get me court-martialed. Could end my career. So I should. Shut up! And didn't say anything to anyone. Soon after I got to Iraq, they made me convoy commander. Now, some of those convoys are 25 trucks long. And I was in charge of making sure that every one of those soldiers and drivers did the mission and got home in one piece. One time. I'm in the lead truck going through a crowded street, but this young guy up in the gutter sheet. Now, he hasn't been out on the road before. He's been in the office doing paperwork for so long, he's getting called Professor Stapler. Now, we got traffic coming at us and civilians all over the place. And this car comes toward us too close for comfort. So being that it's my gunner's first time, he doesn't know what to do. So I tell him, fire a warning shot. He doesn't shoot. So I tap him. Hey man, don't be afraid to fucking shoot that weapon, okay? You do 
know how to shoot, right? The vehicle is getting closer and closer, but the moron still doesn't shoot, so I hit him hard. Man, I tell you to fucking fire, you fucking fire, okay? You don't never let a vehicle be that close to my fucking convoy. He knows I'm not playing now. So he fires at the car. The hood peels right up, the whole car goes wop, 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 rolls over its side and tumbles over this bank. My gunner panics, he's only 19. He grabs his head and he yells, oh my God, I think I killed somebody. Look, it's not your fault. I don't think you shot nobody, but we've still got a lot of shit coming at us, you hear me? So I need you to focus right now and pay attention. But his face is red and he's yelling, oh my God. But when we get back after that, he's got a story to tell the guys. And it makes him feel like he's matured from a boy to a man. See, a lot of young soldiers feel like that. Women, too, they think, I'm not some wimpy female because of a job I did in Iraq. The longer we stayed in Baghdad, the worse it got. It got so that you knew something was gonna happen every day, you just didn't know what. One day we were uh, driving to this police station in Najif when suddenly this IED blows right next to my Humvee truck. And I must have passed out because when I woke up, I was by myself in the truck and ah, uh, my ears were ringing and my whole body hurt. They gave me first aid and some IV drip field dressing. I had shrapnel. That's little bits of metal in my arm and in my face. I had my eardrops ruptured. I went to hospital and they cleaned me up. They gave me painkillers, but I didn't work for a month because I was deaf. So I just hung out on base, watched a lot of movies, and slept. The shrapnel's still in there. They only take it out if it's really big. Took it out of my face. The scars, but it's not hideous. My hearing's not as good as it used to be. But I wasn't phased about being wounded like that. I was like, okay, I'm alive. Now, in fact, I was pretty pissed. I didn't get hurt worse. I really hated it out there. My friend, Michelle Whitmer, she was on our platoon. She got hit too in an ambush. Shot in the armpit, hit an artery. 20 years old. She died instantly. My tour in Iraq was a real eye opener for me. Because my biggest sending me out there was my own company. Officers would brief us by saying, it's Indian country out there, go get them. I found that very shocking. If this was Indian country. Perhaps I'm on the wrong side. But when I was over there, a lot of young people would come and ask me for help, especially soldiers of color. And I'd stand up for them against their command. After all, I was old enough to be their mom. But that got me into lots of trouble with my command. I was banned from my unit. I wasn't allowed to talk with anyone. And then they sent me to another base, to Scania. That's where they send soldiers to punish them, because Scania is on a major highway and gets mortar all the time. The whole time I was at Scania, I hardly ever wrote to my son. I didn't even think about home. It's because you become hollow, like a robot. You get up, you do your job, you hear people complain, you talk about this, you talk about that, but you don't look inside. My sister sent me a medicine box with my prayer stuff in. So I'd sit at night, smoke a cigarette, and offer my prayers, and I watch the moon. That 
brought me some peace. That and the songs I would hear the Iraqi moon singing in the morning at Camp Scania, the prayer songs, the songs would echo and, oh my God, it was beautiful, like angels. I'd wake up peaceful because of those songs. I'd be thinking of those songs. Because there were times I thought I was going insane. What the fuck am I doing here? Why am I not just getting on a plane and going home? What am I doing with this pace, this concentration camp? That's when I started talking to the Iraqis who worked on the base. The young ones would come up to me and, and say, you're Indian from India? And I would say, no. And then finally, one of them comes back after seeing the movie Dances with Wolves, and he goes, you're red Indian. And I'm going to go, yes, I'm a red Indian. And he goes, Native American? And I'm like, yes. So I was invited to have a meal with them at the market they had just outside the base. They cook the same kind of rice my people cook, the same kind of bread and chicken. I tell him, we make this kind of bread. <laughs> tell me about your people and your religion. I want to know about your women. I want to know what you think about this war. I found out so many of their traditions are the same as mine. The significance of the moon, our tobacco ceremonies, the way we use sage, and their clan system, how people marry in and out of clans. And I started to think, what the hell am I doing here? Why am I doing this to these people? I started to see how we were changing their clan system, their council system. It's been there for thousands of years. I started to see how imposing democracy means this And I began to think, this war is a genocide. If it wasn't, we'd have things in place to help the women, to help the children, to help the civilians. We don't care about them. We'd rather they die. Die!
my deployment was coming to an end, I didn't count down the days like most people did. Because you never knew if you were going to get extended, and I didn't want to be disappointed. But then the day finally came. I was going home. Sitting on the plane next to Stephen, I was so nervous. I didn't know how my family was going to act or how I was going to cope with being a civilian. And I didn't know what was going to happen with Stephen either. What every girl hates in the Army is you meet a guy and you get close, but you never really know what kind of guy he's going to be on the outside. People can present themselves however they want over there. My friend was really in love with her boyfriend from Iraq. And when they got home, she took a plane to go visit, and uh, she waited at the airport for him to pick her up. He never came. You know, when I arrived at the airport and, and uh, I got off the plane, there was nobody there saying welcome back or nothing. I was disappointed. When you see on the news people coming home, there's all these fireworks and all this. Nope, nothing. Just me, getting off the plane, carrying my bags. Didn't even believe that I was back from Iraq until I saw my grandpa and my aunt. My aunt gave me a hug. Now, I never cry, ever, only when Grammy died. But I cried. Just coming home is it's hard. It's like you're a ghost. It's like you died, and you're coming back to life. And you've got to weasel your way back in, because everyone has had to adjust without you. I came back a completely different person. Not as easygoing, I, I can't stand loud noise, I don't like being around a lot of people. And I lost how to dance. I think I'm so in tune with marching that I gotta be really drunk to dance. I started getting really depressed. I, I, I never used to usually get like that, you know, I, I can usually deal with things, but I think it was, you know, the army and Iraq and Grammy and losing the baby, it just all got too much. <laughs> and it made me really angry, the way that I was being treated as a female veteran. We don't get the same respect as men. We have to really fight for it. I eventually stopped telling people about seeing death and being shot at because nobody believes me. Everyone just assumes that I did office work. I moved east to be with Stephen and to go to school get away from my family. And then I got pregnant by him again. He's a sweet guy. But he's different from before. He's from the hood. Yeah, he's got whoever he had before he had me. I don't know if he has them now. But he had to go back to his life and I had to go back to mine. So I guess I'm having this baby by myself. Whatever. You know, to this day, I've never told my family about my time in Iraq. And they ask me, and I just go, oh, it was hot. But I don't want to tell them anything, because I don't want to feel sorry for myself. And the people close to you, they don't understand anyhow. You can't hate them for not understanding. But a lot of the time, you do. ask the majority of soldiers, do you know what our purpose is in Iraq? They couldn't tell you. Some might give you some political bullshit to justify it, or say that because we wear the uniform we're supposed to not speak bad about it, but most soldiers would say they don't see the point. If you think about this area here as the place the military built for us soldiers, you got showers and running water, a toilet you can flush. You got trailers, beds, mattresses, air conditioning, washers and dryers, big generators, you know, running all night. You got subways and Taco Bells, PXs, good food, lobster, shrimp, steak, and we're not paying the Iraqis any property taxes or anything at all for all our luxuries. 
But over here, on the outskirts, you got Iraqi families living in huts. No electricity, no running water, who are starving. And you tell us when we go outside these gates and there's a kid on the side of the road asking for water. We're not supposed to give it to them. We've got warehouses full of water. But I can't give one bottle to this kid who don't have any because we bombed the shit out of his water supply. And everything else too? The US government isn't gonna stand for someone coming into our country and telling us how to run things like that. So we think it's fine to go on over there and westernize them. These people have been living this way for centuries now. I may not agree with their way, but that is their country. Who's used to say that our way is the right way. You know what we are? We're just bullies. Bullies. That's what we are. When I got home from Iraq, I kept everything to myself. I thought I was gonna be okay. I uh, went straight back to school and worked hard. But by a year later, I was tense all the time. Snippy to my friends. Stopped hanging out. I did homework every night for hours. And I wasn't sleeping well either. But I didn't get any help though. I thought my problem was hormones or something. Girl things. Maybe that's because those post-traumatic stress videos they show you never represent women. <laughs> I don't act like a guy. And I'm getting to a car, driving miles an hour, and punch things! Oh, crap. So, uh, well, I didn't recognize that there was anything wrong until my boyfriend was like, you need to get some help. So I did. So people ask me what the best part of being in the army was for me. Is it the drive that I have to succeed now, or all the friendships that I made? Think of a best part. Every day there was a bad day. By the time I got home in April 2004, after 11 months in Iraq, I was really a mess. I couldn't sleep for more than 50 minutes at a time, and I'd be awake for two hours in between. I got angry, weaselly, agitated. I had nightmares about the mortar attack. Flashbacks. On New Year's Eve, they had fireworks in our town square, and as soon as I heard the booms, I fell to my knees. Every time I opened my eyes, the faces in front of me would fade away, and I'd be brought to that night we were attacked. I was crying hysterically. My friends didn't know what to do. And I had nothing to talk about. All my friends' conversations were about movies I hadn't seen or fashion I didn't know about. Anything I talked about turned morbid very quick. Little kids in Iraq, death, mortar attack. Then everyone would get quiet and no one would know what to say. I remember this girl talking about how she wanted some designer purse and I said, yeah, I know what you mean. One time in Iraq, these kids wanted some food and I felt really bad because we didn't have enough to give them. I hate it when you can't get what you want. Everyone just sat there. They felt like assholes. I felt like an asshole. I was so out of place after I got home. I just didn't feel comfortable in my skin and I couldn't talk about it to anyone. I didn't know other soldiers were going through the same thing, so I thought I was crazy. My back and head were injured too. I'm 80% disabled now because my back so messed up from banging around in the Humvee, no shock absorbers, hitting my head on the ceiling, compressing my spine. And I couldn't stop worrying about that guy in the mortar attack, Sergeant Hill, and whether he'd lost his arm, and could I have done something more? I tried to get a medical discharge from the army to pay for my benefits, but they made it so difficult, I gave up. I couldn't get the tuition they promised me for a long time either. For a long time, I couldn't even get to a clinic for my medication or therapy because all the VA clinics were so far away. I work with veterans now, 
So I know a lot of soldiers go through this, which helps. It's important for vets to reach out to each other so you don't feel alone and crazy like I did. Um, I still think a lot about why we went to war. Was Saddam a bad person who needed to be removed from power? Yes. Was he the reason for us going in there? Not really. And it's not the guys sitting in their air-conditioned offices at the Pentagon who are feeling the aftermath of it. It's the mother and father who are getting their child sent home in a box. It's the innocent people of Iraq who've been killed and raped and had their villages turned upside down. I really do love some of those people of Iraq, but I don't know how to help them. Some of those children were so beautiful. They only wanted attention and food. Still, I knew if I had to kill a kid to save my buddy, How can anybody love anyone who has such horrible thoughts? When I came home from Afghanistan, I, I didn't talk to anyone about the rape. That was all my own fault. Took me six months to even tell my mother why I had to go to the Air Force. Why I could never go back. The military has a way of making females believe they brought this upon themselves. Yes, I made some bad decisions, but the guilt lies with the predator, not me. There's an unwritten code of silence when it comes to sexual assault in the military, but if this happened to me and nobody knew about it, I just know it's happening to other females as well. It makes me so mad when I think about the fact that I let them get to me and left the military. I was so proud of being third generation. I had dreams of becoming a high-ranking officer one day, like my father and my grandfather. Now, those dreams will never come true. By the time I came home, I felt like I messed everything up. I let my mom and dad down. I let everyone down. I hated myself. September 30th, 2006. That was the day it was all going to end. No more shame would be brought to my family. It would be over. Take the tip of a blade to the middle of your forearm. Touch the top of the main vein. Press the home seal through your skin. Drag it down so there's no room for mistakes. One shot, one kill. That's what they teach in the army. See the pink blood running bright red? For a moment, it seemed that that gash would bring relief. I was ready to cut the other arm when my phone rang. It was Mama. She felt God pushing her to call. She wanted to tell me how proud of me she was.
went to Iraq, I used to hold healing ceremonies for women. But when I got back, I couldn't deal with those women anymore. To me, everything they talked about was petty. I didn't want to hear it. I lost connection. My mother, my brothers, my son, my boyfriend, everybody. I came back so angry and I didn't know why. Nobody could stand me. I couldn't stand myself. It's really hard to admit you have PTSD. It feels weak because the military teaches you to suck it up and drive on. After I'd been home for a while, my former husband, George, died. Now, he'd raped me and beaten me up, but I went to his funeral anyway. Maybe just to make sure he was dead. But there was another part of me that cried. Not because he was my husband, but because he was a Vietnam vet who had got lost. He didn't come back to the United States. He always talked about raping girls in Vietnam. So what he did to me wasn't any different from what he was used to. So whose fault is it? I don't know. But I don't think he was born that kind of person. I think the military made him like that. And I forgave him. After all, I had to do for him. After I'd been home from Iraq for about half a year, I wouldn't even wear makeup, wouldn't dress up, didn't care. Couldn't concentrate, couldn't sleep couldn't work, and I became paranoid thinking people were following me and breaking into my house. And I was afraid to take sleeping pills because I thought that would make me vulnerable if somebody attacked me. And I was broke. I joined the army to get off welfare. And after 22 years in the military, here I was on welfare. Again, I'm not the only soldier going through this. My friend who I served with in Iraq came home a year ago. They found her dead in her home. She'd been dead for two days. Had PTSD and depression so bad, and she couldn't tell anybody because there was nobody to tell, so she killed herself. The war isn't <coughs> over when you come home. <coughs> One thing I really can't stand is for people to come and say, Thank, Thank you for your service. service. I hate that. Are you thanking me for participating in a genocide? Is that what you want? Because I am not protecting anybody's country. I am taking somebody. Now, even though I never pulled the trigger, I feel that I participated in a genocide. I feel very responsible, and that's a hard thing to live with. <coughs> Everything we've done in Iraq is a lie, and I feel very ashamed. I didn't see it soon and stand up against it. I was a drill sergeant. My job was to teach other people's children how to kill. People ask me, how could I, as a spiritual person, teach people to kill? How, as a mother, could I send my own sons to I asked myself that. I bought into the whole thing. I thought it was the honorable thing to do. I can only hope my ancestors are like me. Or that I'll be able to forgive myself. Myself.
is the playwright of the show. Um, I'd like to welcome Helen on to the stage. And if we can find some chairs, there are somewhere. Uh, do you know where they are, Sylvia? Okay, great. We'll just get to them in a second. Anyway, as Helen takes her time to get onto stage, I'd just like to say that Helen is the uh, playwright of the Lonely Soldier monologues. And this is based on the book that she wrote, which was called The Lonely Soldier. Um, the Lonely Soldier uh, inspired two things. One thing was a, a law uh, suit against the Pentagon, in which Helen um, testified twice. And the other thing is uh, The Invisible War, a documentary about women and sexual harassment in the military, in the US military. Um, those two things, it was uh, uh, Oscar nominated. So that's one thing. I'd like to welcome her. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Emma Norton, who's um, a solicitor who works for the human rights organisation uh, Liberty. Liberty is, um, was founded 34 years ago and, uh, and is a UK, one of the UK's oldest human rights organisations and fights for our civil, civil liberties and human rights. So I'd like to uh, welcome Helen. Emma! <laughs> Eva! <laughs> many of you would like to ask, um, I'll ask Helen, um, Helen first, if I don't get the names wrong, Helen, uh, what, are these stories typical of the stories that you've seen or heard? Um, they are really representative, much more so than I realised when I first started doing the research. Uh, <clears throat> I spent three years interviewing some 40 women who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And many of them I interviewed for many, many hours over and over again over that three years, gradually winning their trust. And then I found all, a, a lot of studies that had been done uh, in the States of veterans about sexual harassment, sexual assault, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And I found the horrible statistics that 30% of women said they had been sexually assaulted by their comrades while serving in the military. That was almost one in three. And 99% had been harassed, which completely reflected exactly what I was hearing uh, from the women and some of whom you, you met tonight, as it were. So uh, the combination of the traumas of war, um, of the culture of the military, of this underfunded, uh, wrong-headed war, uh, which is corrupting the soul, um, and the way they were treated by their male comrades and their su superiors was uh, gave, left them really with double and sometimes triple traumas. So yes, indeed, these are very representative stories. Um, and of course, individual are individuals. There are some people who have better experiences than others. Okay, um, well, I'm going to pass it over to Emma. It's a US play, um, a US story, and I remember when I did the reading in 2013, uh, I had somebody from the uh, UK Army who came up to me and he said, um, Prav, I'm just going to say one thing to you. It couldn't possibly happen in England. So I'm going to pass the baton on to you, and please could you answer that? Well, I would have one thing to say to him, which would be Corporal Anne-Marie Ellen. Okay. And that was just a very recent case. Right. And um, we only know about her because she's dead. Yes. She, 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 this is a, she was a war military police officer. And in 2009, she was based in Germany. She alleged that she'd been raped by two fellow Royal Military Police officers. She reported it. It was investigated by the Royal Military Police themselves. Unsurprisingly, no charges were brought. She was subjected to a campaign of rape-related bullying. Her mental state deteriorated. There were, it was just one problem after another, and she took her own life in 2011. And the only reason we've been able to get to what happened to her is because she died and because there was an inquest. But there are, I am sure, and I know because some of the women have called me, other women, lots of other women, uh, who have suffered rape, who have been able to survive to the extent that they haven't committed suicide. And so these 
what happens to them has remained hidden. So uh, I don't doubt that it's a, a problem in our midst as well. One of the questions, the American women appear to be very vocal, and I'd just like to ask Helen, how vocal were they about their stories? What did they, you know, were they forthcoming or did you have to tease it out of them? I approached the interviews <clears throat> originally just wanting to know why they joined the military and what it was like being a woman at war. Um, why would a woman in particular join the military in the time of war, I wondered, and so did was everybody else was wondering the same thing. Um, and I never, I have a lot of experience uh, interviewing traumatized people. It's something I've done a lot as a, a writer and a journalist. And you don't ask directly. But all I have to say is, after winning their trust over long hours of listening to them about their backgrounds and whatever else they wanted to talk about, was how, how did the men treat you and how did the other women treat you? I never asked a more pointed question than that. And um, some of them would come out right away with these stories. Uh, Clara, the one who tried to commit suicide at the end by cutting herself, told me very fast what happened to her, amazingly fast. But others um, took months before it finally came out because it was so extremely hard to talk about. Sometimes they'd have panic attacks in the middle of the interviews and we would not be able to breathe and we'd have to stop. So uh, it's not easy. I, what you're seeing, of course, is a condensed version of, of, of hours and hours and hours and months of conversation. But all the words are their words. And the songs are real military songs. And I wanted to be very true to that because they struggled so hard to get those words out. And they told their story so well. And I wanted to honor that by making a, a real verbatim play. Uh, what do you think the prevalence is in the UK? Since we haven't got these voices, apart from the Anne Marie Elements case, so is there any other cases that you could? Uh, well, I've to? got colleagues here from other firms who who represent people who are subjected to harassment, bullying, including sexual sexual harassment, sexual bullying. So I think it is quite a significant problem. One of the major issues is the army is very, very bad at retaining information and publishing information about right. it. So depending on who you ask and when you ask them, you will get a different answer. But the most recent statistics that they published were that there had not been a single conviction for rape in court martial of between 2012 and April 2014. That was just a snapshot. They, they, by their own account, there wasn't even a single prosecution for rape. So, and there was just one other important statistic. Two years ago, 400 women were polled, service women, every single one said she'd had unwanted so that suggests that there is a very serious cultural problem. In the Do you think it's a silent problem in, in England that is bubbling under the surface? That maybe, I think, like well, the voices that we've heard, the American voices that have come out, and we've had the book and we've had the play, so therefore it's out there in discussion. How far do you think we've got to in the UK regarding this issue? I think uh, there's increasing concern about it, increasing awareness about it. It, but it's always really difficult to, you're saying to a victim or a survivor of sexual violence, come and share your story. Well, that's a really, really hard thing to do for anybody, and it's an especially hard thing to do if you, if you live and breathe and work, you know, and play in the armed forces. That's your entire environment. So if it happens to me in, in civilian life, it's appalling, but my family are not connected to the, the, what has happened to me. My workplace is not connected to what has happened to me. But if I'm, if, if I'm in the military, none of that is true. So it's, it's like a double, triple whammy for those people. It's very, very hard. I think that's one of the things that you found, Helen, is that um, the military is an all-encompassing world that these women live in, and therefore uh, it's very difficult for them um, to come out of that world. And if they do, they're shunned, they're excommunicated, and therefore um, it's a question, you know, that, you know, how did you find many of those women felt? Did they feel that they betrayed their comrades? Well, firstly, they were all veterans. So they had all <coughs> separated from the military uh, by the time I, I interviewed them. I never would have got these stories out of active duty soldiers. They would not ever tell me such things. They were still invested in protecting themselves and not being seen as, as, as traitors, as whiners. Um, and they also had signed a release saying they weren't allowed to really talk about the real things that went on in the military while they were on active duty. 
gag rule, as we called it in the States. So that would have been a useless exercise, and I knew it. I had to wait, I had to find people who had reached the phase where they were willing, they needed to talk. These women really wanted to talk to me, but for different reasons. Some because they felt that they were not getting the recognition that they deserved for the, for the danger they'd gone through and the fighting they'd done. Some of them because they were angry at what we'd done in Iraq. Some of them because they were angry about what had been done to them. And they wanted to be heard and they wanted their real names used, which I did for the book. So they, it took such courage for those, and some of them retreated back into not being able to talk about it afterwards because post-traumatic stress disorder, you go through phases when you can talk and when you can't talk. But um, the, uh, this was not, the, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is that a lot of them had no idea how prevalent this problem is. Mm -hmm. They thought it was all, the, they were the only ones and they were alone, and one of the things that playing Book of Cheese I'm so happy about is that they found out that they were not alone, that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of women who've gone through this, and a lot of men too, and I hope that happens here. Yeah. And the more people speak out here, and more others will be encouraged to. I'm just going to get uh, Emma. <coughs> Liberty's running a um, military justice campaign. Would you like to just... Uh, well, that, that goes... It, it, it's kind of snowballed, not by itself, um, but it, we've been really quite overwhelmed by the momentum and the, the um, interest that it's attracted from the public and from serving men and women and from people inside the army and the chain of command. There is a lot of interest and concern about it. Um, could you just explain exactly what the military <coughs> justice campaign, what you're trying to achieve we, we, with it? Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of our audience don't know what this campaign well, is. Well, it, it started off with a number of cases. So Corporal Anne Marie Elements was one, but we're also representing two of the Deep Cut families. The Deep Cut is, uh, some of you may have heard of that moment young people that died in very suspicious circumstances, never been properly investigated. Um, and we've got lots of other cases, uh, less, less profile, but nonetheless just as important. So it came out of that. Um, but as soon as you start scratching the surface of what's happened to these people, you realize that the fundamental problem is that the military, military is allowed to investigate itself. And even in cases where it's not technically allowed to investigate itself, by the time it's got to any outside independent involvement, they've been able to sort of deal with that shut it right down. Plus you have the cultural problem that it's really difficult for serving men and women to speak out because they are then shunned and they're looking at their career going down the path. So it, 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 was, it was a response to all of these problems that we were identifying. The hopelessness, the interminability, if that's a word of the complaints process, just how it's almost designed to wear somebody, somebody down and to disincentivize them from complaining. And also this, this cultural problem with women that the armed forces clearly have, and in particular their absolute inability to deal with cases of sexual violence and to support those, those women. Um, so one of the, the things that's come out is what is the response uh, you know, to the people at the top in the military <coughs> when these stories come out? What's happened in the US? Has there been any forward steps towards uh, improving the situation of women that have been sexually harassed? Rate, um, any you know, yeah. laws in place that may help their situation? The, com the combination of uh, the lawsuit that came out of my, my work and the, um, and the film, <coughs> um, which focused on the lawsuit, was terrific because people are, people's minds are changed more by movies than they are by books, alas, <laughs> for me as a writer, but it's true. And that film, The Invisible War, was shown um, to the government and it was shown to the military top brass. Um, <clears throat> it's become standard viewing for all Marines, incoming Marines now have to watch it, uh, this documentary about sexual assault in the military. And it's really stirred people up. So yes, there have been changes in protocol, there have been change, some changes in the way rape is reported, the way victims are supposed to be protected and looked after. Um, and who you report to has been moved up the chain of command. Now we still, and, and President Obama also said in a speech that this was a problem that had to be stopped. So the first time in history that the president, the commander in chief has recognized this as a problem. But there's still a huge issue, which is similar to here, which is that <clears throat> the military has its own justice system and it decides whether to investigate and prosecute any wrongdoing within itself. 
So if you imagine a corrupt corporation and we ask the CEO of the corporation to investigate wrongdoing in his own <coughs> company, ha! I mean, it's an obvious conflict of interest. Mm. It's obvious that they are going to be invested in covering it up, and that's exactly what happened. So the only solution is to take these cases out of the military altogether and put them in the hands of civilian courts. And until that happens, we're going to keep getting cover-ups and, um, and lack of justice for, for the victims. Um, I'm going to ask Emma, have we had any forward steps <coughs> because of the Anne-Marie Element case that, um, you know, what did the, the uh, coroner say at her second inquest? Well, the, the coroner was extremely critical of the army and found that the um, act of alleged rape, as he put it, had directly contributed to her death and the bullying had contributed to her death. So if you want, you couldn't hope for a stronger verdict. Um, and when we got that, we then wrote to some senior members in the uh, armed forces and um, invited them to talk to us. And to their credit, a couple of them have, and we've had a series of meetings. <coughs> I don't doubt that there are some pretty good people up there who want to try and get it right. Mm -hmm. The problem is I hear them still as quite lone voices. Mm -hmm. And they are still inside the armed forces, and with with the best will in the world, they are just not qualified. They are just not qualified to deal with cases of sexual violence, which they see primarily as a disciplinary problem, not as a crime that needs to be stamped out and needs to, that where people need to be held accountable. So, what, what, is, what is Liberty actually fighting for? What would you like things to be done? I understand there have been some small steps in uh, regarding the ombudsman. All of those cases where there has to be, where there are serious sexual violence cases, or, uh, cases that are sufficiently serious, su sufficient seriousness must always be dealt with by civilians, they say. Is that they what you would like to be done? done? There can be no reason for uh, the army to be investigating cases, or uh, the armed the services police to be investigating those cases. We say they need to be taken out and placed in the hands of civilians, and at the moment there's an enormous lack of clarity about when civilian police are involved, when service police, that's army or navy police are involved, and so, so that needs to be sorted out. And the new armed forces ombudsman, which has been trumpeted and heralded, and is a very, very good step, mm -hmm. it doesn't go far enough. She still, the, a, a woman she's just been... If you could just explain to sorry, the audience... Um, the ombudsman's job will be, she doesn't yet <coughs> have her powers, to investigate complaints. And she is external and she's independently appointed, so that's a really, really good thing. Um, but her powers are still limited, and she can only get involved after a service person has been through the internal complaints process, by which point, in our experience, they've usually given up because it's so hopeless. But nonetheless, we think that, that it's a really positive step that they've appointed her. She is independent. She does have better powers than she was originally going to have after lobbying by us and other organisations. Yes. So that is a positive So is that step. not a liberty after the Anne-Marie Element case? Did you not, was that the original uh, lobbying? Ombudsman to, to, uh, the, the day, or the, I think it was the week of this critical verdict, clearly it was Philip Hammond at the time, wanted to be able to announce something. So he announced the creation of a new Ombudsman with very, very limited powers. Right. And then very heavily criticised. And that was in 2014. It was just last year. Right. And then after a lot of lobbying, they conceded by the, the Defence Select Committee's own recommendations that it needed to have greater teeth. She right. now does have that. Still doesn't go far enough, but it's a good step. Um, and the other things we want to see are um, the, the main thing. The main thing is the Human Rights Act. You've probably all heard that we're, we're going to repeal the Human Rights Act, apparently, um, and that is an absolutely vital tool for servicemen and women. Um, the uh, Element family would not have got a fresh inquest without it. They would not have got a fresh rape investigation without it. The deep cut families would have not got anywhere without the Human Rights Act. Uh, and and uh, other rape cases where, where women report being raped, it's not being investigated, we're, we're able to use the Human Rights Act to force the police to investigate. These are it's a hugely beneficial piece of legislation for service people, and the MOD and the government wants to scrap it. Okay, well I am going to, there's a lot of facts here, so what I'd like to do is just open up the debate to anybody in the audience. Um, and do we have any Twitter comments, Barzil? Well, I was just trying to text Celia upstairs, that's why. Uh, in the notification, we just have someone saying that um, just saw a great play, Lonely Soldiers Monologue at Cockpit Theatre about uh, gender injustice war. Uh, no specific question, but uh, oh, that's people lovely. following and <laughs> 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 Oh, absolutely. Um, so uh, I'm just going to let you say, we're having people watch this all over.
over the world and they can uh, enter into this debate as you can because you're live which is even more exciting so um, uh, Helen would like to ask Emma the first question but after that I am going to yeah. open and over it out to you uh, my question is whether now that you've seen the play and you've heard the women's testimonies do they do their stories echo what you're hearing here well, it's interesting. The, sto the, the, the women so far that have contacted me have all been uh, on barracks, either in England, so not on active of, of operations overseas, or on British barracks, of, but abroad and not on active operations. Um, but in terms of the culture of sexism, absolutely. In terms of the sense, the enormous sense of disloyalty that she then feels for having had the audacity to report a, a, a rape. Absolutely, yeah, it does re resonate. Can I take uh, questions from the audience? Or, okay, lovely, thank you. My question for Helen, actually. Um, are you still in touch with the women who you originally spoke to? And have they, have they read the book, seen the documentary, and seen the play? And what, what do they think of it? I'm in touch with some of them. Um, uh, I was in touch with more of them, but as the time has gone by, I've, I've left some of them alone you, because they need to move on. Some of them have told me that just my voice triggers the memories, which triggers a, pe a flashback or something, so I'm actually bad for their health. <laughs> but um, <coughs> they read the chapters in the book and to, to make sure I had it right, they had all had the book. And a lot of them came to see the play in when it first opened in New York. And then afterwards they came up on stage and the actors stood behind the, each soldier who they played. And um, it was very moving and then they both would take questions from the audience. There wasn't a dry eye in the house, I can tell you. And they bonded because I'm sure you, the actors here would relate to this. They felt like sisters because they, even though they'd never met, they felt they knew each other so well, and they all went out afterwards and got totally plastered. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is a question. Well, it's it's a question followed by a comment. If that's allowed. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, I was interested in the comments about PTSD uh, because I work with a lot of service personnel, mainly men. these testimonies in your play come after many, many, many hours and right. not much time. And, and I was very struck by the, the comment that, uh, that the character made about women's PTSD being different in its manifestation to, to men's PTSD. And I wonder if you had any, yes. any view to Yes, that. uh, that's been studied now yeah. in the States. And there are significant <coughs> differences in both in the rates of PTSD and how it manifests itself. Women tend to turn their violence inward more than outward compared to men. Um, uh, there are similarities, self-destructive behavior, you know, uh, drug abuse, uh, alcoholism, um, but women are often dealing with the double trauma of a sexual harassment or assault on top of a combat trauma. And sexual harassment, PTSD was actually a, a term coined originally as a, a, about rape survival, not about combat. Uh, <clears throat> so there are these, these, a lot of women end up spinning down into the vortex and they end up, up homeless uh, uh, in larger proportions than men, not numbers, but larger proportions. So, so those are some of the differences. Okay, I'm just going to, is there a question over there? Yes, yeah, yeah, I've got question. both uh, of you really, in Katie, both can answer me. Um, what, what is the policy instrument that allows the military to treat criminals allegations within the military as internal policy issues. Why why is that allowed? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. One of the one of the important aspects mm -hmm. of our of our campaign is um, I mean it, it's quite complicated, but there's a military justice system mm -hmm. and there is a civilian justice system. Right. And uh, it seems to us it's not never quite clear which one is supposed to apply. Um, the, the the narrative is civilian is supposed to have supposed to supersede, yeah. um, uh, but there are a number of cases where, so a, a commanding officer is in charge of his troops, 
he is required as a matter of law, if he is notified of certain criminal allegations, to refer it to the police. Right. He has to do that. Rape, murder, GBH, that sort of thing. There are a few exceptions to that, and one of those is sexual assault. So if a commanding officer receives a report of sexual assault, he is not required as a matter of law to refer that to the police. Either service police or civilian police, he can use his discretion to encourage the complainant to just let's deal with that internally, primarily as a disciplinary matter. So, and we say that that sends an absolutely horrendous message about how they see sexual violence. Um, but more generally, there is an enormous lack of clarity as to when civilian is supposed to apply and when military jurisdiction is supposed to apply. So you, depending on where it's happened and who's in charge, you might have the local police force investigate. In another case, it might be the military police investigating, and it, that really does need to get sorted out. I think I'd like to bring something in. I think with the Anne Marie Element case, it's quite uh, it's, uh, it happened abroad, didn't it? Yeah, and that was in goes, Berlin. Uh, was it Berlin or was it Germany? Germany? It was in Germany, and that caused uh, another complication. Obviously, I mean that's the reason why there's a separate system mm. because obviously, if a commanding officer's in, I don't know, if he's in the middle, if he's in Holland, probably. Yeah they need to be able to apply British law. So that's what it's all about. Right. But if you've got a case like Anne-Marie who's in Germany, she's on barracks in Germany, uh, there is a theory, you know, you wonder why it's the same system there, what's wrong with German law, but, mm. but in any event, that was a really extreme example of how wrong it can go, when it wasn't just um, the service police, it was military police investigating other military police officers. I mean, it would be like police officers at the same police station investigating it, it just would never happen. Yeah. So it was extraordinary that that wasn't identified as a problem until it was far too late. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to take that question over there. The yeah, question for Helen. Uh, it's, it's a question to Helen, the dramatist. Uh, clearly, you've got a lot of authentic testimony, and that is both a great good and it's a restraint. You want to be authentic to the voice of these women. As a dramatist, and all, you know, in a second, related point, you know, Emerson said, around a circle, another circle can be drawn. Now you've obviously drawn your circle around sexual harassment of women in the American army. The other circles that you move out that are hinted at and touched upon in the voices of these women are sex, uh, are, are, is rape and violence as an act of war. Traditionally, men raping as an act of war, giving three days to rape and pillage in cities. But the actual invasion of Iraq and any invasion is itself a rape and violence of that country, not to mention the issues of nationalism and so on. So, um, and the one moment of real horror in all this testimony, however brutal and, and, and disturbing it was, was the chant at the beginning and end. And there was nothing in the testimony that went close to the real deep horror upon horror upon horror, the piles of bodies and the rage, and you know, the images that come out of that. Where might you have gone with this if you were dramatically free to take it from? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm going to get, I'm going to defend myself first. <laughs> because, um, I wasn't interested in doing that. I mean, I wrote a novel. I did it in a novel. I'm a novelist, actually, not a playwright. And that's where I was free to go deep inside, uh, where I think, where war happens deep inside people and where it corrupts the soul. Uh, further than the soldiers could even say. Um, but with this, I thought the power in it was because these were the real words of the soldiers. And because they were saying things, we have, this play is a little historical now, because I was doing this, these interviews um, from 2005 to 2007, uh, eight. And at the time, America was very, very rah-rah about the war, still. And you didn't hear much criticism, and you never heard criticism from within the military, from soldiers themselves. So what these women were saying about genocide, about the Iraqis being like them, about, about killing children, about their guilt, about what were we even doing there, was radical, um, more so than it might sound now. Um, <clears throat> what I did do as a dramatist was take the stories and instead of making them one whole story, one at a time, like monologues traditionally are, I split them into three acts and I pulled the structure 
and they're parallel stories, you know, from before they went to war, war and home, because I wanted to show the arc of what war does to people and how it changes people. Um, and I also wanted to go in and out emotionally, you know, so there's some that are more analytical, some that are more emotional, some lighter moments, the way you would do in a fictional play. So uh, there was actually quite a lot of structure that I was able to do, even within the confines of not being able to actually write the words. Um, but in terms of, of what I would do otherwise as a play, I have no idea. I've never given it a moment's thought, and I'm not going to make that up on the spot. But as I said, I wrote a novel which is out there, and you can read it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take one last question. Um, I just was wondering if there was any, any, any veterans you met that you considered pos had survived psychologically at all through all this trauma or who'd had resolution so were able to deal with it. Yeah. I mean, every story was incredibly moving, but out of the 40, was it, that you really followed? I just wondered if there was anybody who seemed to, shall we say, have a more positive story and then managed to get through it. Yeah. Um, with so help or without help, yeah. or if they had a complaint, actually had it resolved through the military. Oh, well in the latter, the latter part of your question, mm. did they have it resolved? Absolutely not. No. Um, that almost never happens. Mm. So that's that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I can fill you in a little bit on what happened to those soldiers since the play. Um, the, uh, Terrace, the um, African American, uh, went back to war. She had to deploy one more time. She went back to Iraq. Um, she was fine though. She was angry about politically, but she was fine. Mm. She was a very strong person, and, and she had a very strong, supportive family behind her, which is all important in how you cope with any kind of. She's the one with the four children. With yeah. four children yeah. who I met, and the husband, and yeah. they're terrific. Um, so she was fine until she went back and I then lost touch with her, so I don't know what happened then. Um, <coughs> Sylvia, no, Maria, the one with the boyfriend, mm -hmm. um, she ended up for a while in a homeless shelter for, for veteran single mothers, raising that child on her own. Um, and she, I am happy, then she got onto Oprah. <laughs> and I'm happy to say that I've changed. She is, uh, she's like a cork, she just bounces back up and yeah. she now has a very important position working with other soldiers in the Department of mm. Veterans Affairs and, uh, and is doing very well and I believe she's just got engaged. So she's fine too. Um, <clears throat> the Native American one, Santiago, has, uh, has had a very, very rough time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the others, I don't know. Right. I lost them. Thank you. I'm just going to conclude this because we're, we're running on, and uh, Helen and Emma are going to be outside, and you can ask any more questions. <coughs> I wondered if um, anyone would like to say a few words about liberty and what they do. Um, yes, well, as you said, we are a very old. You said 34, we're actually 81. 81, I meant, <laughs> I meant founded in 1934, yeah, yeah, yeah. so please yeah. forgive um, me. But, but, uh, if you if you care about the Human Rights Act and if you care about military justice, please think about joining us. You don't need to be an active member, but just sort of us being able to say that there are all of these people that are really concerned about this at the moment would be enormously uh, valuable. And that's a really good practical thing you can do if you're concerned about the state of the nation at the moment, which some people are. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank Helen. And I'd like to thank Emma. And most of all, I'd like to thank the actors who are doing an amazing job. My technicians who are amazing as well. Uh, this is the first time we've live streamed the show to everywhere. Do tell people, not in England, but anybody who wants to because we would like them to come live to the show. But if you know anybody in America, um, I will give you uh, an email, a link, and you can tell them to watch the show wherever they might be. Um, so, and uh, most of all, I'd like to thank our Kickstarter backers who kicked it all off, and that's why we're here. Thank you very much, all, all of you, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you.